Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books, where each week we interview an author of a newly published work of nonfiction that we believe is worth your time. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the University of Texas Brownsville or this station. And now, here is your host, Dr. Bill Strong. Our book today is called Learning to Fly. It's by Steph Davis, and she is well known around the world as a uh, cliff climber, I guess, a rock climber, and uh, as part of that small culture that knows each other around the world, and she's well known in that. But this book is called Learning to Fly because she eventually decided there wasn't enough excitement in climbing uh, cliff faces like El Capitan and decided that she would like to quite literally fly. So she learned to fly in a squirrel suit. She learned uh, to uh, parachute and uh, base jump and uh, clearly a a young woman who's uh, in love with adrenaline. But uh, exciting story, a wonderful book, and glad to have her on for a chat this morning. Hi, Steph. How are you? I am great. Thanks for having me. So you've taken some time off from risking your life every day to write a book. (laughs) (laughs) Well, funny enough, it was hard to find time to write it um, because I, I was still doing everything. So in the end, I wrote most of this book in a car or a truck. <laughs> Going from one place, from one cliff face to another. Yeah, uh, well, some of it I, I would, um, I like to go go camp in my truck mm-hmm. um, at climbing areas and just, you know, stay and go climbing. So I would get in the back of my truck at night with the computer and work on it. And then other times, um, my husband, Mario, we'd be taking road trips to go on a base jumping trip and mm-hmm. I would just sit in the passenger seat with the computer and work on it. Well, it's probably best because you would uh, go do a climb, and then I'm sure while climbing you remembered things that you wanted to uh, write on the computer that night. Well, you know, a lot of this book is about places Mm -hmm. because places are, you know, obviously really meaningful, I think, to people and, and really to me because you get to know these places really well when you when you climb rocks in them and base jump there. But but it was funny because a lot of times I would come up to a chapter about a place I hadn't been for several months or a year, and then it would just be a coincidence of scheduling that we would go there. For example, um, the Little Colorado Canyon in Arizona, I had to write a chapter about that that was coming up. And then Mario and I were driving to Arizona to see my parents down in Tucson, and I was sitting in the passenger seat trying to write the chapter, and we were driving right past the little Colorado. And so I was just looking out the window as I was trying to describe the landscape, and it was so much easier than if I hadn't been seeing it out the window. So you can write it as you live it. Yeah, and um, and towards the end of the book, I, I have a chapter about Latterburn in Switzerland, and then, funny enough, I found myself on a trip to Latterburn <laughs> while I was writing that chapter. And so... um. So it really, it really made it easier to write about these places because a lot of the chapters I ended up back at those places while I was writing them. Well, as I was reading your book, it reminded me a great deal of Cheryl Strayed's uh, bestseller last year called uh, Wild because you, like Cheryl, have a literary background and... And you uh, were seduced by the wild, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and so the two are complementary, I think, in, in beautiful ways. But let's begin with the notion of, I think it's uh, uh, an unusual thing for many people to consider living a life that is uh, climbing uh, rock faces, and most people consider it very, very dangerous. So how did uh, this mild-mannered literature major uh, make that leap into the world of climbing? Um, I think that it's mainly about curiosity. Mm-hmm. I think that where I really like the most is learning, is what I've realized. And so the first day I went rock climbing, I, I actually went because I didn't know what it was, and somebody asked me to go, and having no idea what it was, I thought, well, I guess I'll go find out what this is. <laughs> and, um, you know, just realizing there was this whole world out there that I didn't even know existed. Um, as much as the activity itself, that's what drew me in so much. And um, especially with jumping, same thing happened with skydiving, base jumping. I I stepped through that door and I, I realized there was this whole world going on that, that I hadn't known before. And it's just so fascinating, all the different people and the places and you know, so much beyond just the activity itself. That's 
kind of what inspired me to write the book, is I, I just thought, this is really interesting stuff. I'd like to share this with people who also aren't aware of it. Uh, you made me think of Oscar Wilde's famous quote, said, most people exist, but they don't really live. And uh, reading your book, I see that, that you live. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's what we can do here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the, the first... Uh, challenge that was the the grandest, so to speak, where you felt, uh, I'm on my way now, I've really done something magnificent? Um, well, actually, it's not something I write about in this book. I, I wrote about it in my first book, which is called High Infatuation. Mm-hmm. And um, at the time, I was living in Yosemite, California, and, you know, the biggest rock face in America is El Capitan, and it was always this really huge, famous achievement known in the climbing community to free climb it in a day. Because when you free climb it, you use ropes, but the idea is you only climb the rock. You don't ever grab the rope. You don't ever grab anything. You only touch the rock. And so that's already a big thing, to free climb El Cap. But then to do it in a 24-hour period was always this huge benchmark of achievement in the climbing world. So um, so you're climbing. Right? you're climbing for 24 hours? Um, well, as long as you do it within 24 hours, then you've done it in a day. Okay. So any any time that you would finish would still be in a day. You know, sadly, if you did it in 24 hours and two minutes, it wouldn't be considered <laughs> that would be in one right. day. Because, you know, there's always these finite boundaries of what we call things. But, um, and but and so what is that? Me, that's that's 2,000 feet? Sorry. How how tall is it? It's 3,000 feet. 3,000, wow. Vertical feet. How do you sleep? And they're just... There's just not really an easy route on it. Um, well, if you go for it in a day, you try to climb continuously. You know, you might take a little nap or something, but you just want to you want to get it done. You know, within that time period. But so, where, but where so where me, do you take a nap? Uh, well, when I did it, I slept on a ledge for a couple hours. Wow. And I guess you tie yourself on or something. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're into a rope all the time, so mm-hmm. you usually just make sure you put a knot in, mm-hmm. just in case you, <laughs> yes, but, you yeah. but you don't, <laughs> you usually don't do that. <laughs> I read about well, a guy, I read about a guy, uh, last year or something who climbed in, in Yosemite, the, I forget what it was, he climbed all four major cliffs in 48 hours or something. Do you remember that? Um, there's been a lot of records like that in Yosemite because mm-hmm. these are really big formations, and mm-hmm. that's the thing. Everybody's trying to find ways to um, make a mark in a way. So there's been speed ascents of every climb. There's been link-ups of all the climbs. So, um, you know, it's just this endless endless um, combinations you can make there. I want to read the first paragraph of your book because I r- really enjoyed it, and it pulled me right into wanting to read all of it, and it fits with what we're talking about right now. You say that uh, falling into dead air felt nothing like I thought it would. I'd spent much of my life trying not to think about it. It was my worst nightmare. After 20 years of going up rock faces and mountains, the idea of free falling through the air was essentially X'd out of my brain because you can't think about falling when you're climbing or you won't go climbing anymore. In the few instances during my climbing career when my mind had flicked there, I'd yanked it right back. I figured if the big fall ever came, it would all be over. Wham, just like that. I'd slip off, I'd start falling, a stab of panic, then somehow I would just disappear or everything would go black or something and that would be it. The end. That's a really beautiful beginning. Thank you. And I think it puts us in the place of, because, you know, you wonder, how do you go from being the person whose DNA says, I must cling to this rock, to being the person who says, okay, let me fly? It is a really big mental shift. And and I tell people, I almost think it's harder for a climber and somebody who likes to climb without ropes sometimes to start jumping than for somebody who's not a climber. I think so. The only thing I could relate it to is I... I've been a motorcyclist all my life, and I can't ride on the back. You know, I can't oh, be a passenger. Yeah. I'm a terrible passenger because, <laughs> you know, you, so you give up control or something. And so, I mean, it's it's only a small way I can relate to what you're talking about. But I understand it must be something horrific to let go. It, yeah, it really is. 
So let's talk about that. So you, but you didn't go right into the squirrel suit and start flying around. You uh, first decided you were going to learn to parachute, right? Yeah, yeah. I started um, skydiving, and that is where you jump out of an airplane with a parachute. And the first time you did a tandem jump. Yes, and kind of like you said about the motorcycle, I really didn't have a good experience doing a tandem. Yeah, you say in the book that you uh, thought you would never parachute again. Yeah, and um, and then funny enough, when I learned to jump solo, um, so it was me doing the jump, as I was being instructed, it was a completely different experience, mm-hmm. and I really liked it. And then you just got it to be a junkie right away, and you started jumping two or three times a day, right? Yeah, I, you know, that's usually what I do when I find something I like. <laughs> I just kind of dive in <laughs> all the way. <laughs> it was basically what I did when I started climbing, um, just kind of put all my attention into it. And, you know, there was so much to learn. And you learned to pack your own chute and all of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a, it's pretty regulated with skydiving, unlike base jumping, which is where you jump off cliffs and that's very free, like climbing. Skydiving is really regulated because you're dealing with airplanes, which means um, everything's overseen by the FAA. Mm-hmm. So when you go to the drop zone, there's a whole training course that you go through to learn to be a skydiver. Um, you have to pass through these levels, and you have to learn everything and um, do it step by step. So that was part of the whole process I was going through. Um, pretty accelerated, but as long as you do everything, they don't care when you do it. <laughs> I love the pictures in this book. It's rare to have uh, so many beautiful National Geographic type of pictures of you climbing and jumping. Uh, in fact, you, there's a picture of you here jumping in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, this is the uh, base jump. And yeah, in Twin Falls, uh, they have this great bridge there called the Prine Bridge. Yes. In fact, that, that's why I noticed it. I said um, just last year I had dinner at a restaurant right under that and so i oh, could okay. so i could relate immediately to uh, the dramatic height of that uh, of that bridge and that that must have been one cool jump it's a really beautiful bridge mm-hmm. and do and do is it against the law to jump off of it no um the prime is this amazing thing because it's a great bridge it's ideal for base jumping and actually the town of twin falls has totally embraced base jumping because they are really smart, and they see that it's good for the economy because uh, jumpers just come from everywhere. They jump that bridge all day long. People run courses there. Mm-hmm. The tourists love it because everybody mm-hmm. wants to watch the jumpers. Yes. So um, it's a really nice example of, of people being smart about it, basically. Well, let's suppose that I wanted to get into base jumping, and I have no experience whatsoever with base jumping. What would I need to do to learn to do it safely? Well, um, there is an option now which never used to exist, funny enough. Um, my husband, Mario, and I started a business in Moab called Moab Base Adventures. Mm-hmm. And we are taking people on tandem base jumps off cliffs, which you can't really do anywhere else in the world. So um, it is not a first step to learning to base jump, but what we like about it is that it's a possibility to see if you like it mm-hmm. um, before you go down that road. So we have a lot of people that come because they're really curious about base jumping and they just want to see if they like it. So they do a tandem jump with us, and either they like it and they go off down the road, or they say, you know, that was good, I'm glad I did it, but that's it. Um, if you want to learn how to base jump, it is kind of a long road because first you need to start by skydiving, and so you go through all your skydive training. Um, and actually the funny thing about the book is is that when you read the book, it'll give you this all, almost like a how-to manual of how to start jumping. Um, so you become a skydiver, and then after that, you have to do, usually people recommend you do 200 skydives at the minimum, mm-hmm. um, and once you've done that, you can sign up for a first base course at the Prime Bridge in Twin Falls, and there are a few people that are offering it. The people that I talked about in the book that taught me mm-hmm. are Apex Base, my friends Jimmy and Marta, who I think are the best. They're really the the most known in the community. They've been doing it for the longest, very respected. And they run base courses at the Prime. And once you've done that, it's funny because 
you can just go off and be a base jumper. I mean, you can always just go off and be a base jumper, but that's probably the smart way to learn how to do it. Um, Mario, my husband, is now offering first cliff courses here in Moab because there's a little bit of a gap of time where you learn how to jump off of a bridge and then you're just kind of sent off to go learn how to jump cliffs, which are kind of more dangerous. Why, why, so are, they, why are they more dangerous? Um, the bridge is safer because there's nothing to hit. Uh-huh. So when you jump off the bridge and open your parachute, there's nothing behind you because it's an arch bridge. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you have a cliff in the picture, now there's a cliff wall right behind you. So it's possible to hit the cliff, which is the worst thing that can happen. Yeah, I would imagine. So that, That'll ruin your yeah, day. So, yeah, and then there's a lot of factors to learn about, things like wind, um, the conditions, angles of cliffs, um, different places that you could choose to leave from. So it kind of gets pretty complicated. So I think it's good that, that we now have the first cliff course for people because they're it's pretty. It's a pretty big step to go from jumping off a bridge to um, jumping off a solid object. So the nice thing is that nowadays, you know, you can really come into it in a relatively, you know, I put the word safe in quotation marks, but you can do it in a safe progression compared to the pioneers that were <laughs> yeah. doing it in the late '80s and early '90s and just making it all up as they went along. Well, and the, I, I assume that the materials used in the in the shoots are are much superior than they were long ago. They really are, because base jumping was evolved from skydiving. So in the late 80s, they were taking skydiving equipment and just trying to modify it for base jumping, Mm -hmm. which, you know, was generally successful, but not always. Mm -hmm. And now um, there are several manufacturers that make base-specific equipment um, very, very specific. So, for example, you can buy a different parachute for short cliffs that are 500 feet tall, and you can buy a different parachute for tall cliffs that are a couple thousand feet tall, and it's it's all very um, refined and very specific now. So the gear is really good. Well, do you know, since we're in Texas, do you know any places in Texas that are good for base jumping? Um, you know, the jumpers I know from Texas are jumping antennas. Oh, okay. They're doing the big radio antennas and things like that. Yeah, and that's um, those are, that's how you get the word base. It's actually an acronym, mm-hmm. and it stands for Building Antenna Span Earth because those are the objects you can jump off of. I didn't know that. I, I think I knew mm-hmm. part of it, but I didn't know uh, you know the whole thing that that it was uh, had all those words. I didn't know the Earth yeah. part. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a, you know, normally we would say cliff, but they had to make it be a word. So. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the, what is the, uh, go back to the climbing, what is the number one cliff in the world that you have to climb to, you know, have have reached nirvana in the cliff climbing world? Um, well, I, I do think the most famous, cliff would be El Cap. I mean, mm-hmm. everyone knows it. Every climber knows it. It's a it's a great cliff. But, you know, among climbers, there are so many famous places and mm-hmm. so many dream walls that, that people have. Um, where I live in Moab, it's much smaller than, than the cliffs in Yosemite, mm-hmm. but we have these beautiful desert towers, and I think Castleton Tower, you know, every climber knows Castleton Tower. Well, there's some place outside of Las Vegas, the the Red Rocks or something that they said was uh-huh. a big rock climbing area, but I don't know yep. how it rates on that, the scale of things. Nope, that's a big destination, too. And, and are, Waco are there, Tanks, Texas is a destination, actually. Which one? Waco Tanks, Texas, down by El Paso. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's a really famous place. I used to go spend my winters down there. What about... Um, the difference between how do you distinguish between mountain climbing and cliff climbing? Well, mountain climbing is um, what you would more think of things like Mount Everest um, or K2. And it usually implies those big high altitude snowy mountains where, Mm -hmm. where it's not so much going to be technical climbing because you're wearing a, you know, a snowsuit with gloves and (laughs) boots and crampons. Um, So that's, that's more of mountain climbing. And alpine climbing, technical rock climbing, that more implies that you're going to be doing climbing of some kind of technical difficulty. 
it looks to me from looking at your pictures like you know a person must be very strong to do this or at least have a BMI of 12 <laughs> you know it's it's a lot strength to weight ratio mm-hmm. um cuz you'll see uh with the really extreme technical form of climbing where people are climbing in gyms inside they might never even climb outside um you know little girls are often the best climbers because they're so light and tiny So it's really a lot about strength to weight ratio. But, you know, there's so many different styles of climbing. If you go to do alpine climbing, you want to climb a big mountain that has technical rock climbing, it's going to be pretty nice if you can carry a lot of stuff in a backpack and still climb hard. So there's a lot of different styles that are different. You know, people are suited to different things. Talking about, uh, you know, the the strength to weight ratio, I have two boys, 12 and 8, and I took them to a rock climbing um, gym. And out in Las Vegas, and they loved it because they could just scale those walls so easily, and then they could rappel down, and they uh-huh. just they just did it all day, just climbed up, you know, three stories, and then uh, rappelled down. They thought it was the greatest fun in the world. <laughs> it's really good for kids. Yeah, it's a great workout. I mean, I did it myself a little bit, but they were way better because <laughs> 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 because they're so light, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. Has, has anyone climbed uh, El Capitan without ropes? I mean, just I mean, tr- truly free? Um, people have done it. There's there's some routes kind of towards the sides uh-huh. that are a little shorter and less difficult, and people have done it on those. But um, but it it's not really considered the same thing as like the main proper face of it. Yeah. And to this point, no, no one's done that. And what are the mistakes that? newbies make in cliff climbing what are the you know the things that uh, are typically uh, errors of uninitiated um i think one of the hardest things is to get shoes that fit you right because mm-hmm. climbing shoes are pretty tight mm-hmm. and that's why they work well because they kind of crunch your toes together so you get a little power point under your toes and you mm-hmm. can stand on small little tiny nicks and edges but it's really hard to get that size right at first. So a lot of times people will get the shoes too small mm-hmm. and then their feet hurt so much they can't climb. Um, and then sometimes you go the other way and you get them so big that they're loose and then they they don't give you any kind of support. So I, I think it's really hard to get the right size of shoes at first. And I, th- I see that a lot, which sounds like a funny thing, but it makes a big difference because when your feet hurt so much, you can't actually stand on them and then and then you wonder why you can't climb and you're tired, so it kind of leads to this whole downward spiral. Well, let's go on forward from rock climbing or cliff climbing to uh, squirrel suits because I've always been fascinated by these because I've seen them in the movies where people put on the squirrel suits and they look like an airplane flying around. It looks like they have great control over where they go, and, of course, they make it seem like they're in the air for hours, but uh, I assume it's... Uh, it's a descent like any other that happens yeah, in five minutes or so. Yeah, definitely not ours, unfortunately. <laughs> so but, what's, what is that like? You know, can you can describe that? Like it. Yeah, it's, um, it's, you, you wear a suit, um, usually we call it a wingsuit, and it's nylon, and the way the suit is constructed, you have fabric under your arms, and you have fabric between your legs. So what it's doing, it's increasing your surface area. Yes. So when you jump out of the airplane or you jump off the cliff, it's reducing your fall rate and translating that into forward speed. So depending on the size of the suit, how well you fly it, etc., cetera, um, you can slow your fall rate pretty significantly and stay in the air maybe, you know, maybe even four times as long as without the suit. Mm-hmm. And you do have maneuverability. You can turn, you can dive, um, you can pop up a little bit, you can... You know, you can do tricks. You can get next to your friends and hold hands as you fly. It's, it's really, it's a pretty amazing experience. Is that the is that better than base jumping? In your well, base jumping, you can do it with the wingsuit. So oh. if the cliff is tall enough, the base jump can be done with a wingsuit. Whoa! And then and to me, that is the best thing. That's the best one where you jump. But but how high do you need to be? What is the threshold? It needs to be at least 600 feet, or what, what's the what's the magic number? Um, well, it's two things. You need a long enough vertical expanse 
to get the suit moving forward into flight when you jump off. So Mm -hmm. when you jump off the cliff, you're not flying forward until you reach terminal speed or until you catch air. Mm -hmm. So, and with the advent of the newer, bigger suits, that, that number is becoming less and less, but, but you do need that, that first initial distance where it's at least vertical so you can start flying. Um, and then beyond that, you need enough elevation that's coming in the form of steep terrain or something to, um, have enough flight time before you pull the parachute. So at this point in time, um, like I say, things are evolving constantly with the, with the new suits, but I would say a pretty conservative estimate is that you would need at least six to 800 feet of vertical distance to get the suit flying to be safe. And then you really need about, I would say at the bare minimum, 1,500 feet of additional elevation to, to get any kind of small flight out of it. And that would be on the very low end. Do you think there'll come a time when these... Uh uh, jet suits are functional for a lot of people. The ones where, where um, they, they have the, you know the actual power pack on their back and they can take off from the ground. Oh yeah, I've seen those. They do that in the water, don't they? Yes, yeah, for they people. do in the water. I've seen it in the water. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, you know I don't really know much about those. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a very different thing yeah, because yeah. you're dealing with the forces of nature and just going with <laughs> going with the flow, so to speak. And this this would be a, a whole different world of power packs and. Uh, yeah, exactly. Control, control of a different type, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, you're trying to ca- uh, harness nature in a sense and go, go with it the same way well, gliders Well, the thing about do. the wingsuits is um, it, it's probably better to compare it to a glider because, you know, no matter what, you are always going down. You, you can never... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can't ever get yourself to go back up, unfortunately. Uh. Well, I, I tell you, I love the book. It's a, it's a really good read, and it, I think more than anything, it just uh, makes those of us who live less exciting lives think about how we might make them more exciting. And uh, But I think a lot of this you need to start when you're younger because, um, I mean, it seems to take quite a quite a strong, well-conditioned body to, to do a lot of what you do. Well, yeah, but... Um at the same time, I, I am a believer that, you know, you can always start new things, mm-hmm. um, especially with rock climbing. For example, I have a, I have a friend, he's, um, he's 65 now, mm-hmm. and he climbs harder than most people <laughs> that are, you know, half his age, and um, he's climbing harder than, than even existed when he first started climbing as wow. far as difficulty. Well, that's, he's 65, so, that's impressive. Yeah, it's really an inspiration, mm-hmm. and um. And funny enough, there are a lot of climbers out there at this point who are in their 50s and 60s that that are just out there climbing all the time and, and not climbing easy things either. So if one wanted to come to your school out in Moab, if one wanted to come there, how would we reach you? Um, I have a website at highinfatuation.com. Oh, what a good name. Also, <laughs> that's the name of my yes, first I book. Yes, I know, but it's still a, good, and, um, a great name for your business, but, too. But as far as um, our business, that has another website at moabbaseadventures.com. Okay. So the website has a different name from the business, but High um, high Infatuation mm-hmm. is my site, mm-hmm. and the Moab Base Adventures is the business site. Okay, very good. I'm so glad you were able to uh, give us some of your time today off the cliff face. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, enjoyed the book. The book is called Learning to Fly by Steph Davis. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, if you want to get more details, you can go to our website uh, at uh, goodbooksradio.com or on Facebook, Good Books Radio Show.